Uh, who hasn't shown up right now, but honestly, this is a group of revolutionary thinkers. Um, Justin Rosenstein was here at 2 o'clock talking about redefining and redesigning civilization. Many of you just heard Daniel's talk based partially on his book called How Soon Is Now, making concrete solutions to these massive problems. Um, we have Unity Grace, who really is a spirit holder, a, a grid walker on the planet, who looks at the cosmic movement of the planetary alignment, and, and Aubrey Marcus, who's camping here at Playa Alchemist, who's from Austin, Texas, who talks about how to, how to show up as an individual in this, in this movement of, of, of transformation. So we're going to kind of take the first few moments, and again, the story that we're talking about here is the story of the future of humanity. And that's a, just a big frame for us to, to go to today. Um, obviously, we know we got to go deep into all these sectors, but most importantly, we have to look at how do we create systems that allow the whole, the, the whole to work better together. So from that point of view, your talk was really important because you were looking at all the planetary systems and how they need to sort of coexist together. So maybe take it from there. Hi, okay. Justin. Hi, Justin. Hey, man. You want me to summarize? Uh... Whatever you want to go. Yeah. Um... My, my background is as a technologist, um, having I started the company Asana, which makes I started the company Asana, which makes collaboration software that helps a lot of teams work together more easily. And before that, uh, worked at Google and Facebook and co-invented the uh, uh, Gmail chat, Google Drive, Facebook pages, and the like button. And so I've been working for a lot of years on how can you use technology to at, at scale help people to communicate and, and collaborate. But then, uh, starting several years ago, I started going to, this is my 11th burn, so that started a, catalyzing a process of thinking about uh, w what is it that we're collaborating toward in the first place. And through mystical experience, uh, gained more and more appreciation over time of the deep interconnectedness between all of us. We increasingly felt uh, a profound sense of love for all beings on the planet. And, and from that, a real desire to help uh, to, to realize that what we need to be working toward is a development in consciousness of, take, of, of developing civilization to the next level, of taking us from a world that's very me-centered, where people are, where companies are after profits rather than trying to do good in the world, where people are trying to maximize their personal resources or personal brand rather than trying to do what they can in order to gift in order to create a better world. But creating a better world is easier said than done. And started to sort of look at like what are, what is, what would be the the uh, pressure points or what, what would be the ways to try to pivot civilization away from the somewhat dystopian route that it's going down to a better world. And at first was pretty scared looking at the fact that I realized that any one problem that you looked at in isolation seemed unsolvable because of all the other problems. But if you look at all those things as a system, suddenly it seemed very tractable because you've got our economic system, you have our governmental system. You have uh, our food and healthcare and education, and all of these things work together in concert so that it's very hard to solve problems in one without solving problems in all of them. And so what we really need is to upgrade civilization as a whole, take all of those different subsystems and collectively um, move them in a better, better direction that's more in alignment with love, more in recognition of our interconnectedness. Um, and my talk talks about a bunch of specific ways that one could go about doing that. But I think it's exciting to see that in pretty much every area, there are people who are thinking both about short-term solutions to problems and long-term solutions. Um, for example, like Project Drawdown came, came out recently, which is a project that just a bunch of climate scientists and energy scientists got together and determined a, a, the top 100 things we need to do in order to solve the sustainability crisis. And when you look at it, it costs a few hundred billion dollars, but it seems pretty doable. And it seems like we could just go through all the different areas of civilization, ha use, um, you know, bring together expertise in order to figure out what are good solutions, and then start to fund those solutions. So it's a lot more complicated than that. But, but, but I think people aren't... In, it, People who are just looking at problems in isolation, I fear if we don't look at these at a systemic level, we won't actually get to the larger answer. And I think all of us still have more questions than answers. This stuff is really hard. But starting, but really looking at what is it going to take to get to the next level, and as a, and to be able to, as a result, engineer a world that makes Burning Man feel more like the default, a world in which there's instead of war, we have we have radical inclusion. Instead of people uh, working really hard, you know, working multiple jobs to make ends meet, we have material abundance. We have people. We have pe the ability to stop worrying about work because we have automation. And instead of a world where we can focus on making art, making love, exploring spirituality, 
Um, and I think that, that, that that world is within our reach and that it is worth working toward and it will take all of us to achieve it. You're kind of right. That sounds a little bit like my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out there's one truth and <laughs> we're all just seeing it. Um, yeah, well, I guess I just spoke, so um, um, I'll pass it on to you. <laughs> Over to me. Aloha fam, my name is Unity Grace and I am a water carrier. So I say that water adopted me in Christmas Eve 2010 and I went for a swim in a cave on Kauai and it turned me on and it told me where to go and what to do. And that's been my mystical journey. And so I started following the supreme guidance that started coming through like a two-way radio station and uh, started laying crystals, laying prayers, crossing military fences, going into no trespassing zones. And the guidance was showing me where the water aquifers of the planet were. And the guidance said the quickest way to awake the consciousness is to pray with water. One drop of water is all it takes to change the world. Mini Wachoni. So my path has been extremely mystical and it's been a path of love. My message is don't compromise. Listen to the internal guidance and go the distance to the messages that we hear within our heart beyond the mind because the mind cannot resolve the problem inside of the same thinking that created it. And the fastest way home is through love. And that means risking it all for you to live the life you came here to live. And that means letting go of relationships and letting go of jobs that don't serve and trusting that if you push yourself into the edge of the river, as the Hopi prophecy says, keep your head above water, look around, see who is there with you and celebrate because the river knows its destination. And that's the power of water and the transformation that is occurring within the waters of our body at this time. And the more of us that understand the power of water and the more of us that understand that if you just pray with water once a day, your life will become mystical very quickly as my has, so that's been my journey. And as I continued quietly on my journey, I started to get phone calls in the middle of the night from specific indigenous elders of specific tribes telling me that I was the carrier of their bundles and their sacred prophecies. And they started giving me their bundles to carry to specific sites on the earth during specific cosmological alignments. And so I've been working closely with specific indigenous groups that are holding the sacred star knowledge. And this is where we get into this cosmological connection from the star nations to the earth nations and the transformation that we're going to be going through in the next four years next three years leading up to 2020, the reason we're at Burning Man right now, we're at a divine appointment moment when the man burns tonight. We are pushing humanity's consciousness through the Stargate portals into intergalactic peace. It's already done. So that's a little bit about me and um, I am a clear channel. I was born exactly on the new moon at the new moon. So there's no sun to reflect my chart. There's no personality to reflect what comes through. So it's just a messenger of spirit, which is why I've been sought out by scientists to bring through their formulas for their free energy devices, why I've been sought out by the biggest money players on the planet, why I've been sought out by the royal families. It's put me at the middle of big oil, private military, all of the darkest places on the planet and what I learned is that everybody wants the old story to end and we just are all looking at how do we do it and this is my sacred little bottle of water from seven years of a full-time job of walking barefoot on the planet exchanging water it's very activated water I always offer it if anyone wants a drop I have people write me and tell me they have full kundalini 
12 hour experiences after one drop of this purified water so I'm happy to share it and I say the fastest way to change this story is get every single one of us on the planet praying with water hey everybody um, my name's Aubrey I've had the great fortune to meet and work with some real masters. And I think there's a great art piece out there. I was just riding around, actually rode over to Camp Mystic and stopped along the way. And it was this beautiful head. And the head was wise and looking out in the distance, the head of a hero. And it was sitting on top of a couple books. And I looked at that and I was like, yeah, that's right. Because so many people before us, people like Daniel, people, all the teachers that I've read in all these books, we stand on top of the shoulders of those giants. And um, so that's really a big part of my story, is to learn as much as I can, to humble myself, to continually empty the cup. Every time I think I know something, realize that I don't know shit, you know, there's always a bunch more to learn. And, uh, and that's really the main message that I want to bring here, because one of my teachers, who lives down in Peru, he, he holds down a place called the Spirit Quest Sanctuary, offering Wachuma and Ayahuasca. And he's as close as you get to the real life Gandalf the White Wizard. I mean, this guy is amazing. I really highly recommend it. Anybody who's on the medicine path to, to pay him a visit while he's still, he's still up and running. Um, but when I first got there, it was a game changing kind of experience because I've been called to help the world. But he looked right at me and he said, you know, to be of service, you have to be fit for service. And so he told me to stop looking outside until I could really look inside. And when I looked inside, then I could watch the world around me change. And since those times that I've gone to see him that very first time, the world around me has changed from my podcast to my business to my own personal life to the, the gravity and energy that's come around. It, it's all come from looking within. And I think that's a really key message. You know, there's incredible, brilliant minds, some of which are on this panel that, that know strategies and know ways to impact different societal structures and different environmental solutions to all the problems that we have. But the key thing that we can all do is start right here. This is what we can control. And a lot of times I think we project outward, oh, I'm gonna solve those problems. I'm gonna fix all that shit out there. Well, we got work to do here. And until we do the work here, we're going to thwart and circumvent and be our own resistance as we're trying to do the work out there. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're all here. It's, yeah, for the party. But as everybody knows, Burning Man is fucking medicine, right? Like, we're coming up against resistance. We're coming up against something that's hard. And that's how we get ready for whatever's coming next. We don't know what next level it is. It's like, if we're the hero in the video game, we beat one level. We don't know what the next fucking level is. We just know that we got better skills on the level before. We practice a little harder. We pushed against resistance. And practice makes the master. So we get a little bit better the next time, whatever that thing comes. Maybe it's a natural disaster. Maybe it's horrible politicians. Maybe it's all of the above. But as we get used to handling our own resistance, the own shit that's inside us, we'll show up. You know, when everybody else is running and all the pressure is causing them to get greedy and causing them to grab and squirrel away and put, you know, 500 pounds of beef jerky in their basement and just so they can live there and go, ha, 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 die, everyone, I'm going to be fine. Whatever. If you're, if you're like that, I get it. It's smart. Like, I'm not, I'm not mad at people who are hoarding beef jerky. But nonetheless, like, the idea is that we can all show up when that pressure comes and show up and be of service to our fellow man and, and fellow and fellow woman. And, and I think that's the message that I'm trying to bring through my podcast. That's the message that I'm trying to do. And that's what I'm trying to do myself is just help point the ways. You know, I was able to stop in at an ecstatic dance at Camp Mystic totally randomly. And Bandana Hart was there. She came up. I wasn't going to dance, but I had to fix the hair that was in her earring. And I was so inspired by her move, and I just started dancing. And that's one of the great tools. And Samantha Sweetwater here, another teacher of ecstatic dance. There's so many different ways that we can start purging our own shit. You know, it's not just ayahuasca where you vomit into a bucket. It's purging all of it, letting it all go, releasing, and getting strong, you know, and taking care of your body, and working on your health and your fitness and your vitality so that we can be heroes when the time arises. And that's, that's all our sacred calling. 
And when that time comes, I know that a lot of people who've been here on this playa, they're going to fucking show up. And that makes me happy. Oh. Oh. Wow. We've got some good first views of uh, what's happening here. And one of the things, Justin, um, I want to come back to you, that you talked about at your, um, at your talk was how collaboration, how important collaboration is. Again, Aubrey, you're right. We've got to take care of our own instruments. And you're right. The water is life. And Daniel, I forgot what you were talking about. But honestly, the root, no, I wasn't here. I had to step out for a minute. You're, you've built collaborative tools for the workplace. How do we build collaborative tools for this revolution? Yeah. It, it seems almost too simple to be true, but it seems like if we could just all collaborate, we would solve all the world's problems, right? <laughs> if, if we have, the, it, which, is, which is important because they're not, as people often think that they're problems of resources. We have enough food to feed everyone. The reason people are in poverty is because we're not distributing it well. We look at things like climate change. We have the capacity to develop better energy systems that would enable us to get to sustainability, more than sustainability, that it would allow us to increase our energy capacity as a species many times over. But because there's conflicts internally, we actually have, we actually have subsidies that make it hard to move to those new technologies. Um, we have wars, the antithesis of collaboration. So, so many different things. If we could just work together, we could solve these things. Now, doing that is profoundly difficult. Um, because pe people don't, don't understand that their interests are ultimately shared. So part of it is sharing a, uh, in order, in order to, have, to answer your question, how could we get to that collaboration? I think one answer is, is more spiritual and one answer is more logistical. On the spiritual side, the collective awareness that we're all in this together, that we're all deeply interconnected, that we're actually really, sh I think in some deep fundamental sense, one, that we are cut from the same cloth of a, of a physical reality. We're all just different waves in this great magical 3D space that all of us at a logistical level are deeply intertwined. Our food systems, our economic systems, our, our emotional systems, everything is about how we relate to each other. So the more that people, especially people in power, really everyone in the world can, can more deeply come into that feeling of oneness, that feeling of interconnectedness, and tap into that universal love where love becomes not just something that you share with a small number of people or just with yourself, but it's actually something where you concern yourself with the well-being of all living beings and try to create a world that works for all. That will provide us the motivation to want to collaborate toward a better world. And then on the logistical side of, like, okay, then how do we do that in practice? I think that's a really complicated question. Um, but the, I, I was really impressed that the United Nations came out in the last few years, um, they, they did this a few, a few decades ago too, but with a really good list of global goals. And they're pretty sensible. There are 17 global goals, and one of them's like, no poverty, and one of them's um, you know, sustain, sustainable energy. And within those, they have pretty good metrics for how, how do we achieve those things, or not how do we achieve, but what, what are the things we want to achieve, this level of carbon emission, et cetera. So I, I can't believe that a group like the United Nations got to an agreement on those goals. But so far as I know, there is no plan. <laughs> really good goals, no plan for achieving it. Um, I mentioned Drawdown a minute ago precisely because I think that's really exciting as they got a, as a project that took a bunch of experts from a bunch of different related fields, brought them together, and computed essentially what are the things that are going to be most important for reducing our carbon emission, for, for getting to a sustainable situation. And then we, we, and we could do that in many different areas in order to try to get at what, what are the things that we need to do in order to collaborate. So basically, you, when I help companies, I t talk about in terms of you want clarity of purpose, you want clarity of plan, and you want clarity of responsibility. And I think as a species, we have the same thing. We need clarity of purpose, which is universal love driving us to desire to create a world that works for everyone. We need clarity of plan, which is across all of the different systems, different systems of civilization, what do we need to do in order to, to change those systems in order, in order to get, get the outcomes we want. And then clarity of responsibility, which is about all of us figuring out what is our role to play in that. Because there's so many different things that we need. We need systems thinkers and doers and leaders. We need healers. We, we need mystics. We need artists that can help spread the word about all the different revolutions that, that, that need to happen. It's going to take basically everyone figuring out what, are, uh, what, what is the specific skill, that what's, what's in the intersection of your passion with what the world wants. And together, to come together as one team with that common purpose, working on what I talk about as one project. If you think of all the different things we have to do across all those different systems that in order to upgrade civilization, that's this 
leaderless, giant, worldwide one project that all of us can tap into, and that if we work together for long enough, I believe we can, we can collaborate to affect those changes and to, to make a world that works for everyone. We, um, you know, we have, someone said we have the technology and we certainly have the ideas to solve every human problem on the planet. Do we have the consciousness and do we have the relatedness to make it? Because it's the relatedness. We all call ourselves burners, so there's a natural kind of evolution of every relatedness. We're part of a tribe, and tribes have always been a way of kind of convening, you know, leaders and, 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 and work effort. How do we do, how do we create more relatedness as we go forward into this planet so that we can have that intimacy of collaboration? Um. Yeah, but one thing that I sort of didn't touch upon in my talk, uh, Justin and I have spoken about it a bunch, I think, is um, you know, the kind of potential movement towards new models of love and relationship as an aspect of this paradigm transition. Um, I, I guess my, what I write about in How Soon Is Now is, is visiting a community in Portugal called Tamara, um, which was started by these German radicals uh, who were part of the left uh, movements in Germany in the 60s and 70s. And they um, tried to figure out why the sort of utopian promise of those movements failed. And when they stepped back and tried to analyze it, they actually ca came up with this idea that the problem was there were core issues around love and sexuality, which they call eros in their kind of philosophical language, that, that were too tough and, and too deep for people to yet bring up into their consciousness fully and address. And so they felt that they actually needed to create a new social model. So they kind of left society, they incubated these communities, and they sort of rigorously uh, broke apart, you know, every facet of human relating, and then rebuilt from the ground up what it would look like to have a, a, a community model of, 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 a, of a way for people to relate uh, integrally and authentically. And essentially what this uh, required um, ultimately was a model that's based on non-possessive, transparent relating uh, that are, that's mediated by a number of social tools or social technologies uh, within the community. Uh, so for instance, sometimes even every day, like members of the community will come into a circle together called the forum, and people will go to the center of the circle and act out or share all the different relationships they're having with other members of the community. Then they'll get mirrorings back in kind of the third person uh, that help them to just see where they're at, not so personally, but more kind of like objectively from like a meta perspective or something. So I think Tabara is a really fascinating idea and a model for, for, for many reasons. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know the, 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 a deeper question is whether, you know, what we're meant to be as a species. I mean, there's that book Sex at Dawn, which argued that mono monogamy is actually only a very recent construct. And through most of our species history, we were more you know, had loose partnerships, we were more monogamish, maybe. We, you know, we had multi-partner relationships and nomadic societies. And it was really the, the construct of patriarchy and then capitalism and sort of empire and everything reinforced the nuclear family and the monogamous couple as kind of the productive unit of a certain type of society. And, and there are many things that I think are difficult and problematic about that, 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 you know, are becoming clear, which doesn't mean that there are not many people who have you know completely satisfying and happy monogamous partnerships, and 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 for them that that that's probably a good way to be. But but the question is even is that the best or maybe the most integral situation or system for human beings if if we're going to really collaborate together? You know, could could we collaborate in love as much as we're collaborating in you know have to collaborate in all these other areas? You know. Um, I see that a lot, actually. You know, looking at Burning Man, and, and you know, there, there, you know, there's, you know, you know, yeah. I mean, there's like status. You know, Burning Man has in some ways reinscribed kind of like status hierarchies, and you know, and, and so on, and and, and maybe um, you know, relationship to that, to you know, sexual desire hierarchies, and so on. That that makes me wonder if there's not a whole another level of, of liberation that we would have to break through or break into. Um, that that you know requires somehow you know, conscious awareness and, and intention. Uh, and Tamara, for anybody who's interested, they have a global love school. You can learn these practices. And there's so many things that are fascinating about the community. It's like another thing I could talk about for like an hour. But for instance, actually, um, tell me your name again. Unity. Unity was talking about water. And, and for this community, they also began to discover that water was an intrinsic element that had a deep relationship to love. Like they believe that the way a community um, 
deals with love and the way the community deals with water are really like the same thing or reflect each other. So, so they've, they've worked in sort of permaculture. It's a very dry area they're in, but they've created this kind of system of, uh, you know, lakes and, and, and rivers. And the whole idea is that, you know, you need, you know, water like love needs vessels of containment and opportunities to flow. Uh, so they've tried to model that uh, uh, in, in their community uh, and develop also a sacred relationship to water. So anyways, that, that's sort of what I was thinking about when we started talking about collaboration and relatedness and something that I didn't cover in my talk and is a subject of ongoing uh, personal curiosity and fascination. So uh, thanks for letting so me let's, share. Let's take that a step further to, because uh, I, I really like the theme of monogamy as a sort of a modern construct and what is the relatedness that we can have that creates the most energy in, in our love field. And Aubrey has a lot of experience in talking about this, so why don't you pass the mic over. Yeah, so I can bring this down to the practical because I was 33 years monogamous and um, really thought that that was, that was the way humans were designed. And it was the book that he mentioned, Sex at Dawn, where I realized, oh, it's not just the men that are supposed to want other lovers. Women are supposed to you know, be attracted to other lovers too. Damn it, I got it all wrong. Um, and at that moment, you know, from the combination of that with some two really um, paradigm-altering books that I read, utopian books. Uh, the first was Aldous Huxley's Island. Um, how many people here have read Aldous Huxley's Island? Yeah, a beautiful book. I mean, I think that's anybody interested in shaping a humanity from the ground up, you know, again, standing on the shoulders of giants. Take a look at that. And he identifies love and sexuality as a core issue, and especially the education part, even from the start, you know, how taboo it is. And, and right now we're in this crazy world where we're not actually positively educating our youth about sex, but everybody has a phone and everybody's Googling the most graphic shit you could ever imagine. Right? So they're, they're learning how to have sex on Pornhub rather than having like, as in, as in the next utopian novel which I read, which is by Starhawk, The Fifth Sacred Thing, another amazing utopian novel um, where they have actual places where you can learn about love and sensuality and actually get in touch with that and learn the positive side of it so it isn't just you know, the dark expression of sexuality that we see. So I think that's a key piece. But getting it back again to the, to the personal part, you know, as I mentioned, you get better, you become more fit for service by putting yourself up against resistance. And there is no greater resistance for me that I've ever encountered. I've done all the plants, the ayahuasca, the aboga, but being in open relationship is one of the most challenging things you can do because it cuts incredibly to deep to the core. And you talk about, you know, community and wanting to bring together. The only way out of the hell of an open relationship when the girl you love is sleeping with somebody else or the guy you love is sleeping with somebody else the only way out is consciousness and the fundamental principle of consciousness is the metaphysical truth that everybody is you living a different life it's the only fucking way out you can try everything you can try and puff yourself up and be better and build your ego up and say i'm better than that person oh, that's just a snack i'm the meal haha <laughs> you know yeah go for it good luck pathway to hell the next they don't really believe that uh, open relationships this polyamory model can work very well in modern urban civilization, that you actually need to have a community structure because there are levels of depth to it. Like for instance, um, you know, one reason I think that polyamory doesn't really function very well is ultimately you know, women want to have children for the most part, and, and you know, that requires such a long-term investment of care in a modern urban you know, civilization uh, that it's too threatening to not be in a safe, protected container. Um, you know, whereas in Tamara, uh, child care is, um, a, is, is a collaborative responsibility. They have cooperative child care. So a, a woman, because they don't have unlimited resources, a woman, a woman who wants to have a child in the community has to ask for permission. If she has permission, she knows that that child will be raised by the whole community. And past the age of two or three, a lot of the children actually live in, in, in a uh, you know, children's community area. You know, and it's only 100 acres. They see their kids all the time, the parents do. But it means that you know, both, both parts of the couple, particularly the woman, knows she's not on the hook in the same way um, she would be in, in this society if things break down because of that. Um, anyway, I, I just felt that was almost irresponsible not, not, not to mention that, because I, I, I think there's some d deep problems with the polyamory as it's practiced in, in, in the modern you know, urban culture. Well, with, with all due respect to that opinion, I have a contrary opinion, because from actually living the open relationship in you know, not only open society, but publicly talking about it. And 
I think it can be a catalyst for the shift. I think if we wait, I mean, how many people are going to have access to to, to to Mara? You know, very few. There's very few open communities. We got to bring this out and bring this out into the world. And that's what I've been trying to do. And yeah, it's not easy. It's hard. It's challenging. You know, there's all kinds of things that come up. But I think that's, to me, that's the point. Like, this is preparing us for whatever else is going to come. And if you want something that's going to make it hard to look at somebody as you living a different life, have that challenge, right? Like, if you all want to work together and have non-judgment, look at both of your lovers, or your lover and their lover, look at them as you living a different life. Like, that is, that is the hardest thing you can do, but it's the best thing you can do, and it's the ultimately how we're going to change this world is by looking at everybody like us, like, oh, that person is not rich or poor or this color, or that color, or this, you know, that's me just born differently, living differently. And so when the two lovers are, are enjoying each other, that's me enjoying myself and her enjoying myself. And why am I getting upset about this? And so it really challenges these core beliefs and allows you to push up against resistance, just like you do in the gym for your body. This is what you're doing for love and doing for your consciousness. And so it's been valuable like that. But yes, it's super fucking hard. And yes, when kids come about, there's going to be additional challenges. And for that, actually, that book, Aldous Huxley's book, Island, he talks about the mutual adoption club. And that's something that, that was the structure that they basically had. And it's similar to what Tamara has, but I think we can decentralize that from the group because I just don't think that's feasible for the masses. And so, you know, me and my fiance, Whitney, we've talked about when we have kids, we have all of these great individuals who may not even ever have kids, like masters, doctors, brilliant thinkers. Why not have them be with our kid for a week and somebody else be with our kid for a week and we'll raise our kid and everybody, it'll be a village, but yeah, all right, maybe we'll have to transport. Maybe we'll have to use modern technology and hop on planes and, and do that just to make it work. But I think there's a way to bring this to the masses in scale and I think it's going to start happening. And, you know, I've seen it well, happen. We've definitely, we've definitely seen with the last election so much about the uh, underside of sexual repression in our society was like the thematic of the election. You know, whether it was Trump and the misogyny and the grabbing of the pussy comment or Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and his philandering or Hillary Clinton's chief aide married to Andrew Weiner who couldn't stop sexting and then, you know, Roger Ailes uh, getting, you know, thrown out of Fox for sexual harassment, Bill O'Reilly getting thrown out of Fox for sexual harassment, now Silicon Valley, you know, sexual harassment scandals, binary capital collapsing and all that stuff. So th it's, a, it's, like, it's like a plague that's underlying our society. It's like, it's, a, it's like something that we haven't really been able to look at and its full dimensions and address. And if we're going to reach this uh, new vision, future humanity, whatever it is, it's something that we're going to have to do a much deeper dive about. Yeah, I think, the, I think the, we need to get back to a sense of tribe. And I think um, the solution that, that, I've, uh, that I believe is that we all need to create a tribe surrounding us. And I don't think we're going to be able to do that location-based anymore. I just don't think that that's feasible. I think that the people who are your chosen family, the idea that I could get everybody in my chosen family, my tribe, to live in the same place, I mean, it's fantasy. Fuck, that would be amazing. That'd be like being back in a college dorm again, man. Like, nothing better. But the, the, the real, you know, realistically, that's not going to happen. So I think you still need that tribal construct, but I think we're going to have to rely on technology, the technology of transportation but, and the technology of communication. And, that, and then you, you create this tribe around you, and you create this support system where you can push your resources and pool it together. So everybody doesn't have to have all the same houses and vacation houses. Everybody doesn't. You know, there is maybe a communal bank account. There is a way that people don't have to get married to be taken care of. You have a support system where there's still, nobody left behind. You still need behind. a template. You still need a template for tribes, and that's what something like Tamara yeah. is trying to do. I just wanted to give the, the mic to Eden for a second. Thank you, Unity. Um, well, so because of my work with the indigenous, I come back to the prophecies because every single prophecy of the indigenous is coming true. The meek shall inherit the earth. The Western world is obsessed with their lower nature. And whether we deal with it or not, the meek shall inherit the earth. And so the invitation is to deal with our lower nature and join hand in hand with the indigenous who will guide us forth into right relation. 
because the elders who hold the sacred keys and many of the indigenous have been systematically destroyed. But some of the elders still hold the keys to right relation. And right relation is they go two by two. And it's not a word called monogamous. It's devotion. And devotion is a profound diving into love and intimacy. And the next nine years for humanity is all about intimacy. We just came through a nine-year cycle that was all about relationship, the biggest soul contracts we've ever had of coming together to trigger the shit out of each other to release everything that we're not so that we can be ready for the deep dive into what intimacy really means. And intimacy does not start with the gonads. Intimacy starts with looking each other in the eye and saying, I'm fucking scared to let you see the real me. I'm fucking terrified to be raw and real and let you know how vulnerable I feel to be human because the human experience is all about the courage of the human heart. And this is a difficult journey until we get real with each other and start diving into the realms of getting to know each other in place is we have not been willing to show each other and just show up real for a change. And from that place, we can begin to reincorporate the true technology of sexuality and the higher teachings of sexuality once we still the waters of our being, which is the work that you're referring to that we have to do for ourselves. We have to bring ourselves into a sovereign nature. Lots of you are probably familiar with Bruce Lipton, and he wrote a book called The Honeymoon Effect, and he talks about the table of elements, and he says, look, the mass majority of us right now are everything on the table of elements except the seven noble gases. Everything on the table of elements requires a proton or an electron to complete itself, which means that our current state of relationship from the lower nature is all all about energy vampiring. I need something from you. You need something from me. I want to give you my shit because I don't want to deal with it. You want to give me your shit. That's the proton electron exchange. And it's going to keep going that way unless we learn to take the trigger inside the self and sit with it and hold it and allow for the internal alchemy to occur. And once the alchemy occurs, our auric field begins to transmute into a higher frequency of light called sovereign. There's seven noble gases on the table of elements. And they don't come together through need. They come together through choice and they produce alchemy. And this is the foundation of the new earth. Divine union partnerships of sovereign beings choosing to come together from choice because they look at each other and say, I don't really need anything outside of myself. I'm actually really rocking it, and I got all of the chemistry relit within me because we're in a serotonin low, and what medical doctors consider normal is extremely low. We need to get our serotonin levels higher by getting ourselves fit in all the tools and techniques available, whatever lights you up and makes you feel good yeah. that has to do with fitness and the health of the body starts to produce higher levels of serotonin. And once we produce higher levels of serotonin, it creates an alchemical process in the body which activates the 35th gene. We have 64 codons in the human design, and the 35th gene is the shortcut out, and it can write its own story, so, uh, can, and I, it's called I, love. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's a very long um, conversation that you're making, and for me, some of it feels a little bit like zealotry, like I don't know about the 35th gene, and it's so much to unpack. I'm, I'm wondering if we could open it to the audience and get a few different types of questions to share. 
Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, as we talk about human relatedness, something has really surfaced here through uh, Burning Man for me. I co-founded a camp called Red Lightning, and we were founded under the principles of gender alchemy, the masculine and feminine coming together to work together. And uh, um, the rise of the divine feminine is, is very apparent on this planet right now. And, and this, this divide, this, 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 this archetypal wound that happens in our society from the patriarchal society and, and the mythic proportion of that. Can, can we kind of bring it into that? Because the whole story of human relatedness is kind of goes back to that split and how disenfranchised uh, the sexes are now and how we keep trying to come together. And even within our camp, we, we're split amongst gender lines. So can we talk about that for a moment? Yeah, I, I think exploring openness of relationship is important and I generally agree is, is the future. But so, sometimes it feels like it's going to the next step before we've done step zero, which is that there's so much trauma. There, I, pretty much everyone I meet, there's some barrier to intimacy. I think we've been talking about this a bit, but the, 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 I dig in with people all the time on, on this, and, and so frequently hear people express this simultaneous deep craving for intimacy and connection and deep terror about intimacy and connection. And that's just the buildup of so much, seeming like sometimes, sometimes real deep childhood trauma, and sometimes the, the micro traumas of living in the world we live in, in which the, the, the gender norms are so strong. And especially for women, I mean, the, the obvious cliche of like being shamed both for sexual promiscuity and sexual abstinence, is like the, the, the no-win situation. Like, it's understandable how that would lead to trauma. And then for men, the being evaluated based on, on your masculinity as defined in these really old, old ways is very traumatic. And so everyone comes to the table and often, instead of connecting person to person as they desire, is actually just one bundle of, of traumas and stories and triggers communicating with another bundle. I mean, there was a great art piece last year of two children trying to connect to each other, but there was these cages of adulthood around them that made it impossible to connect to each other. We just like have to start there and, and recognize that I think part of what makes it hard is that people are ashamed that they have all that stuff when really it's almost everyone has that stuff. And so being able to be honest about it can, can help us to collaborate. And on, on gender specifically, I think we, I predict we will in the future look at gender the way that we today look at the caste system. Right? You, you, look, at, you look at the caste system and you're like, certain cultures just take that so seriously. You are one of these four castes. And if you're in that culture, it's like, well, of course you are. You were born into a family. It's, you're genetically of this lineage that is of that caste. So clearly you are of this caste. It's like, that's a, but all the associations of what you're supposed to do with your life are totally socially constructed. I'm not saying there aren't clear core, I think the, sometimes progressives go too far in the other extreme and are like, there are no differences between men and women. There's, you, you can't predict anything from, the, from what, whether someone has a Y chromosome or not. That also seems statistically and intuitively not the, to be the case. But gender as you have one particular role to play just feels very antiquated in the way the caste system feels antiquated. And I think, I, I predict in the future we will all be transgender in the sense of having transcended the social construct of gender. Um, thank you. So it's about demystifying what unity was speaking about in scientific terms. And that uh, there's an amazing book called Cupid's Poisoned Arrow um, by a woman who was very smart, very cute. Um, all of her relationships sucked, right? And she wanted to know why. So she studied Tantra, Karetza. She researched esoteric communities uh, throughout history. And um, by chance, she met a man who had been researching the same thing through science. And they perfectly aligned. And so, you know, there's a lot to it, but... Um, the short answer is that the human orgasm not only releases oxytocin, which rewires your neural network to profoundly remember the person you've just had an orgasm with, but it also releases prolactin and other neurotransmitters that make you profoundly uneasy with that person. So it's a, like a double bind, you know. You're, you love them enough to raise a child with them, but your DNA is like, thank you, please move on, new combo, you know. And this hurts because we have longer memories. We connect in, energetically in a much um, deeper level because of our capacity for social relationship. And so um, for me, I have used this information to improve 
my health and my life a lot. But I don't judge, you know, anyone who wants to be polyamorous. And this is a, you know, a noble cause that you are, um, you know, championing is to like release this jealousy um, issue that wastes a lot of energy in our society. It's totally worthwhile. Um, but for those who choose a different path, um, there is sort of a biohack for that in, in terms of relationship harmony and learning to energetically um, respect each other and not be these energy vampires. Um, I think that has a lot to offer. Thank you. I think when, when you want to talk about gender, I think one of the things that's happening that I don't think is good is when we're coming up with you know, a million different types of genders and then those genders can create separation and then that separation can create judgment amongst them and judgment to people who maybe get the gender wrong or maybe aren't aware of it. We're kind of fractioning the society as a whole to a certain degree and it's almost like it needs to go the other way where gender doesn't matter at all, nor does class, nor does color, nor does anything. We see genuine unity. We see everybody for who they are. They can express themselves however, but it's not about carving into little niches. And I think that's something that we all have to be mindful of is, you know, the ego loves to play the game of superiority. And when the rules are stacked against the ego in a certain way, it'll create superiority in a different way. And that's what the ego is always struggling to do, create separation, create superiority. The consciousness knows unity. It comes from unity. It comes from love. And so what we need to be mindful of is carving out in these different little ways. I remember I'm staying here at this camp and, you know, I was carrying my luggage through and as I was walking from the shuttle through the luggage, there was a lot of judgment. Oh, you go into one of those plug and play camps. Oh, oh, okay. You know, I could just feel it. And I was like, all right, like, yeah, I get it. You know, I had a, I didn't come here and do the thing that you did, but that doesn't make me better or worse. You're not better for it. I'm not worse for it. There's other things. You can judge someone on a million different criteria and try to make yourself superior by gender, by class, by wealth, by whatever you want to do, but it's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. And when we, when we start seeing past the nonsense and stop playing superiority games and just recognizing everybody individually, that's when we'll finally come together. And the politicians, they're playing dirty tricks by dividing us even further, you know, because that's the dark side of tribalism. My tribe versus your tribe. Let's go. That's not going to get us anywhere. What's going to get us anywhere is reaching across and like seeing them from their perspective, finding like looking through their eyes, not at their eyes, like through their eyes. And that's the, the step that we all have to take. All right, everybody, take a deep breath. We're at a halfway point. Take a reset here. And we've obviously covered some interesting topics so far. So if you have some topics you'd like to push us in that direction, I'll bring a mic to you in a little while. Thanks, Brad. I'm Samantha Sweetwater. Um, the thing I wanted to bring forward, particularly in the context of sexuality and um, gender, is that I feel so strongly, strongly that the thing we're trying to step out of is the pendulum swing of victim and perpetrator. And I think it's really helpful to bring it back to those terms. Like I think I feel very strongly that we're walking on the shoulders of feminism, but feminism isn't an answer because it's still an ism that recapitulates power dynamics where we're trying to heal wounded power dynamics that recapitulate as we try to heal them. Like we, putting anyone on top doesn't bring everybody home. And so I just wanted to name that and hear any response about what kind of strategies we can use to deconstruct um, victim perpetrator and even savior conversations. I have a lot of skepticism about the hero as the solution. I think where we're, we're going is beyond the victim perpetrator savior triangle and that a culture of belonging, a civilization of um, unity in diversity on in a planetary field of difference, of necessary difference and diversity is one of coming home 
and we need a new story for that that's beyond the hero's journey. Because once the hero comes home, then the hero has sort of lost his purpose or her purpose. And the purpose in this place that we're going has a lot to do with co-creating home, which is a narrative that goes beyond the hero's story. It takes, it's a whole next, next level of the narrative. I love what you said about the hero, Aubrey, and I, I also want to open a vibrant dialogue about what's, what's that um, person of belonging? Wh who is the person of belonging that is the story after the hero comes home, that we, can, that we come into a narrative about how we co-create home? And, and what is the narrative structure of that? There's some very interesting research and work coming forward. I know uh, I saw Dirac Sean Farber here. We've had some incredibly vibrant conversations about this. What, what are those stories and how can we tell them? How can, how can we tell them through collaborative technologies that aren't trying to tell a hero story, but are telling the story of the ant or the story of the beehive or the story, new stories, the story of the butterfly? Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, at Asana, um, as well as at the co-op I have in San Francisco, we actually have everyone go through a training called Conscious Leadership Training that has some of what you're talking about at the heart of it. So I might just expand, because I know the concepts you're referring to. I'll talk about them a little. Um, the, the theory of, of many people is that at any given time, you're either operating in a state where life is happening to you or life is happening by you. There's also some more mystical states that are a little different than that, but in general, you're either either life is happening to you where you are at the effect of your circumstances, or life is happening by you and, and you are the creator of your circumstances. And they predict, I think unscientifically, that 95% of people spend 95% of their time in a to-me state. Life is happening to me, you are at the effect. When, when life is happening by you, you're present. You can see that there's a lot of choices. There's an infinite number of choices in any given situation. You are the creator of your reality, and you can operate as you see fit. When, when you're living in a to-me state, you are inevitably in this drama triangle that you refer to, which is that there's a victim, there's a villain, and there's a, a hero. But hero doesn't mean quite what you think it means. So the victim is the person, maybe it's yourself, maybe it's someone else in the situation, you could be playing multiple of these roles. The, vic the victim is, is the person who is at the effect of the situation. They, they have no control, they're powerless. And it's the villain's fault. If not for the villain, everything would be okay. And then there's a hero, but the, the thing with the hero is the hero is not someone who can actually solve the problem. The hero is uh, someone or something that brings temporary relief. So as an example, if, if you're addicted to drugs, the hero might be getting a hit of that drug it, it takes you out of your victimhood temporarily, but then it's, it's only temporary, so you're back in that state, and then you go around in this triangle over and over again. So the ability, uh, what I found that when, when I first learned this, it was totally life-changing, which, and I started to notice that I spent a lot of time in that state, and still catch myself all the time in that state, of being in some version, basically all drama, all the times that you're not in a present state, I found, this, this is true, really come down to that you've entered into this very standard, familiar drama triangle pattern of, you're a victim, or you're a villain, or you're a hero, or it's, and there's some pl play of this playing out. And the alternative is to notice that mindfully, to, to practice noticing it, and then use your consciousness, sometimes with effort, to shift back from a, from a to-me state to a by-me state, and remember that you're not the victim, I think this is the answer to your question, the alternative to being a victim is that you're a creator. And the alternative to, in this world, if you're, if you're a creator, if you, since you don't have villains and, and uh, heroes to play with, who you do have to play with is coaches, friends who, or, or mentors who can challenge you in your creation or, or can give you coaching in your creation. And then challengers, people who can like push back at you lovingly and, and suggest new ways that you could be being a better creator. But that allows everyone to be coming to the table and recognizing there is no victim. We're all, we're all completely sovereign agents in the situation and that we can move forward together as a group. And that allows for a, 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 a collective solidarity of collective co-creation. Uh, I, I do want. I do want. I do want to suggest we. Yeah. I also, want, I'd love to move off of the the uh, sexuality stuff just because. But but that's interesting. Go for it. No, I just want to say, but isn't isn't that also? I mean, and I love that idea. I kind of agree with you. But isn't it also kind of a privileged position? Because what about people who really are victims, like people who are, you know, they were they were abused in childhood. They're living on the streets, or they're in you know refugee communities. I think that's 100% true, and clearly, if, I mean, physical violence is, is at the extreme where, like, 
sometimes you do. You, you are just a victim. And so yes, I'm, I am speaking from a privileged position. That said, I have seen people do this work where I would have never dared to challenge them on their victimhood because I was like, yeah, that sounds like some fucked up shit you went through. And I've seen really well-trained coaches compassionately, lovingly work with them and help them to deconstruct that actually a lot of that narrative is in their head. And, and, and they're, they're, like, they may have been victimized once in the past, but the continued trauma and the continued feeling of, of and yes, yeah, sometimes it's neurological and nothing short of like an MDMA or ketamine trip is going to cure you, but often there, there really is more choice than we expect. Can we take a question maybe on some other subject besides the gender and sexuality topic? Cool. Yeah, I have a, well, more of a comment that I would like feedback on on a different subject. So I'm doing psychedelic research in Texas, and I think one viable pathway forward is through um, introducing that psychedelics to the medical community and to scientists by speaking their language, which is cytokines and inflammation and um, neural pathways, how you can communicate that way to other scientists about phenomena that are otherwise somewhat difficult to describe. You know, the psychedelic experience is very challenging to describe to another doctor in terms of the therapeutic value. But when you break it down into the biological correlates of the psychedelic experience, I think you have a little more power there. And it's something that we're doing, uh, looking at inflammation and neurogenesis in the brain, how um, in inflammatory markers in the blood and other systems affect the brain and looking at different avenues for treating multiple illnesses through the use do, of... Do you have a question? Or is there, is there a, uh, as, I, as I said, it's more of a... Uh, looking for a, a comment with feedback on this avenue for change. And so the idea is that we go through the scientific realm and then rebrand psychedelics in a way that's medically acceptable and then therefore introduce it to uh, more of a global market. And we're doing research in India similarly um, it sounds like a great idea. I mean, it seems like there's several paths, right? There's the therapeutic model, what you're talking about, a biological medical model, then there's the religious model, and they're all advancing right now, right? Like ayahuasca now has, you know, protection as a religious sacrament in certain traditions, which seems to be more and more extending to even shamanic practitioners. You know, MAPS is working on legalizing MDMA as a treatment tool for PTSD, and they're thinking that will then open the door for psilocybin to be you know, a, a legal uh, instrument. So, and you've got another path, which is great. Well, I was also going to say just one other comment, and I hate to plug this, but it's a it's an area that's very difficult to get national like NIH funding, and um, you know, they're, NIH is not crazy about psychedelic research at this point. Um, our initial studies were funded by the state of Texas and my grandmother, and we're now the ball is rolling, and we actually have grant money going towards this project in India. But okay, this is very specific and not that pertinent to the larger, you know. I mean, unless you have a quick question. Or something. Okay. Um, hang on one sec. Okay. Aubrey, did you have any comment on that? Hey, um, thank you so much for all of the information today and your presence and knowledge and work. Um, specific question on water. Um, I don't know, it feels like for me with the whole conversation with water that there's like a, it's almost like a consciousness that's taken a while to get to and even I don't know how many people here feel super strongly about water, like it really rocks you to your core about water right and access and cleanliness. But for the most part, it feels like that the majority that I talk to, it kind of takes them a while and it's like a feel good sentiment, like, oh my gosh, yes, clean water, we have to have it. But unless you're really talking to people who don't have access to it, where the majority like of their women and kids are having to hike miles a day to get water, they end up going to prostitution, the kids have no education, like is when you really realize that water is life. Um, so with that, I'm, tr I'm wondering, I'm trying to understand what is the more scalable work outside of nonprofits where it feels like it's just a feel good. We're going in village by village, doing wells, access, da da da, but it's so much effort for not that much scalability. And I think for me, I'm trying to understand how to reach that point in every single individual to really get them to understand water is life. Like, I mean, Standing Rock did it, but like, People still, still don't really understand it, just to feel good. Like, is there, what do you guys think in terms of a more scalable, is it just education? Is it more knowledge? Is it just waiting for consciousness to kind of rise? Doing the work village by village? Yeah, thank you. 
I think whenever you look at any one problem in isolation, it becomes, it feels very intractable, precisely because you run up against the, the larger context, and which is all these other problems that are making it hard. Right? It's like, why is it hard for people to get to get the water they need? Well, we have a climate change crisis where we're losing more and more water over time. Why do we have a climate change crisis? Because we have an economic model and a capitalist engine that incentivizes you for uh, taking resources from the natural world that you don't have to pay for, repackaging those resources and making a profit off of it. Why do we allow that to happen? Well, we have a government system that is easy to corrupt and could be put into the pocket of, of corporations, and you get a self-reinforcing loop there. Why, why is it hard for Standing Rock to, right? So, I think that there's both there's short-term and long-term solutions, and fighting the good fights in the particular places they need to be fought is very important because we don't we can't afford for things to just like keep sliding while we try to design a utopia. So I think going village by village, I, I haven't studied the specific problem, but those kinds of local solutions may be very important. But I think we won't solve problems at that level until we start to look at, at the systems as a whole and start to really question. The, the, those those fundamental axioms to our governmental, economic, uh, the, the, those models, um, and it, you know, put pressure on and and, cre and it, it, at least in the short term, create governments that are that are trying to exercise the will of the people and to regulate business and to solve some of those problems, and long term potentially redesign those governments themselves. So I had an opportunity to talk to Starhawk, who wrote <clears throat> that utopian novel, Fifth Sacred Thing. And um, when I was talking about all these problems of the world, water being one of them, like he said, everything seems to be connected. And you know, it can seem overwhelming, because you can focus on one thing, and every single problem seems overwhelming. But he said, in permaculture, we have a saying, the problem is the solution. So all of these people that we have, everybody that we have, if we activate all of the people, then it can happen. It can come down to scale. Right now, it seems daunting because there's only just a microcosm of people who give a shit who are, who are worried about it. But if everybody gave a shit and all of the people hoarding all the resources, all of this money that's like, you know, power and energy that could be utilized across the world for any variety of sense of need, if we could activate all that, then these problems all become dealable and we can start to do that. And it's, you know, it goes back to, you know, there's this vision I had and this vision was, that I was walking around and I was just woke up one time I was and I looked around me and everybody was like a robot and and then I just grabbed somebody and I put my hand on their shoulder and I looked them in the eye and then they snapped out of it and were like oh shit and then that person grabbed somebody on the shoulder and looked them in the eye and that person was like oh what was I doing and that's how this thing starts to happen. It starts, it's not by just keeping this to ourselves and holding judgment for those around. It's reaching out, finding those ones who are on the edge, finding those people who are close, grabbing them on the shoulder and saying, hey, like, here's a different way. Let me show you. Let, let me let you feel it. Let me let you feel the love. Let me let you feel how good this life can be and how beautiful it is when we all get to work together and do it. And I think, again, it goes down to that work. It's gonna have to be that ripple effect and I see it happening, you know, ultimately I'm optimistic, but I think, like you said, the only way is going to be macro. You got to change the consciousness. It's the tip of the pyramid that's going to affect all the things at the base. Maybe water is one whole row here, but unless we fix that pyramid, which is the consciousness, we're not going to fix water. We're not going to fix poverty. We're not going to fix anything. So we got to keep pointing back up to the top, which is where the heart is. It's not where the head is. It's where the heart is. Cool. There's one for you. Um, can I make a comment on water? Yes. So my purpose is to deliver useful information that you can walk away with today. I say that we stepped into these bodies and we left the owner's manuals behind and our bodies are bags of water. So in order to resolve the conflicts that we see outside of ourselves, it's about learning to still the waters of our bodies. And we have two hemispheres of our brain, the left and the right. And if we can bring those two hemispheres into balance, which is how dolphins and whales exist, we can actually still the waters of our bodies. And when the waters of our bodies are still, this is the states that all the gurus and sadhus teach us about to find that stillness within and if we simply cross our ankles cross our cross our wrists
clasp our hands, close our eyes and deep breathe when we're feeling ripples in our reality and just hold that pose until we feel a mental, emotional or a physical shift. And when we come out, uncross and grounded in with our eyes open because we have to be the change and if we still the waters of our own bodies our water communicates non-locally with all water on the planet and this is the best fastest way to clean all the water on the planet for all life and it's a simple technique you can take away and no one can take it away from you so that's my comment about how we make water more accessible and how we clean the water up on the planet. We use our bag of water to clean all water. This is for the lovely water keeper, uh, Unity Grace. Yes. Um, so I was very... Um, sort of enamored by your journey that you went on, your awakening when you felt uh, you were in contact with various other forces. You mentioned, uh, you know, the royal family and different kind of leaders, etc. And I'm wondering if you're willing to be a little bit vulnerable and would be willing to share your experience, your awakening and perhaps detail what that was and, 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 and the details of it, like what is it and, and how is it. And um, I know it's the kind of thing that you sometimes hold back on because of the way some people might perceive it, but I think there's people amongst us that are ready to receive what you may have to say and what you may have experienced. Thank you. Can you, can you do that in a fairly short manner? So you just want to know my actual awakening process? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Well, I can do it in a quick manner. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful cave on the island of Kauai that's very sacred to the kahunas. And I went for a swim in that cave at sunset on Christmas Eve 2010. This is the power of water. They say that that cave has no bottom, and if you follow it through, it comes up under the Great Pyramid of Giza. And so, when I came out of the water, my, I say that my Merkaba, my energy field, was completely activated. It felt like from that swim in that sacred water, I suddenly had a generator coming from my solar plexus, which continued for 10 months. And from that place, it was direct download from source, like a two-way conversation in my head, full on. That's the power of water. Water is the greatest teacher I know, and it's taught me everything I know, and it continues to teach me. So that's, is that short enough? Does that answer your question? And in one sentence or more, what do you feel was the conclusion of your experience? Like, what did you take away from that, that you now know? That's a great question. I took away love and that it's worth risking everything for love. And that true love is possible. And it's worth risking everything in our lives to embody it because true love is so beautiful that it will transform the world faster than anything else. That's what I learned. And that's what I embody. And that's what I live every day. Who has another question back here? So I have a question for Miss Unity Grace. If we're all one being, and we're all awakening as one creation, and we're experiencing ourself awakening together with everyone, diverse individual, 
how do we really embody the next step of sovereignty in our intimate relationships if we also choose divine union? And how do we I was hearing this brother to the right speaking about fighting and fighting for our right of water. And, and I'm curious at what will it take for this burning man to be the last burn of the man and for us all to rise together in unity, consciousness, and love and choose this together. And how can I be that part of the solution that I wish to see in the world more than ever in this incarnation? And how can we witness no more plastic, no more war, where we can sit across from each other in intimacy and true love as man and woman, gender free, beyond gender, beyond duality? How do we really do it now? in this portal that we've been blessed with. I feel this is the greatest festival of all our lives, this moment. And for whatever reason, we all came back at the same time. So I'm curious, how do we lay down our shield, <laughs> lay down our, our wall, and finally do this? Thank you for the question. The simplest thing I know is when we're triggered to own it. Because the moment we project the trigger outside of ourselves, we're giving our energy to an old story that no longer serves. So it's just about self-mastery, no different than learning a martial art. Am I going to let my energy spill out? Or am I going to learn whatever techniques are necessary to learn how to hold the energy in the water vessel. The easiest way I know when I'm triggered is to cross my ankles, cross my wrists, clasp my hands, close my eyes, and deep breathe until I feel a shift. It's simple. And to do the work over and over and over every time we feel a trigger because if we allow the trigger to continue, we're just engaging with an old aspect of duality that most of us agree is no longer serving us. And none of us want to experience this pain anymore. It's the greatest motivator to just say this is kind of a broken record. So to own our triggers, to use whatever techniques we've learned, there's many techniques. And just hold the energy and be with it. This too shall pass. And as we learn to hold it, all those lower aspects of our human nature that keep us divided just burn off. They dissolve away. The alchemy of holding it, the intensity of holding it, allows it to go through the steaming process of the fire and water meeting and dissolve away. And the more of us that take 150% responsibility for our relationship with everything, with the earth, with the sky, with each other, the more of us that just take responsibility is simple. The wisdom keepers have told us, be the change. It's the primary thing. Just own our triggers, hold them, allow them to alchemize and the world will very quickly be a much better place because as we alchemize the waters of our body still and higher implementations of consciousness higher vibrations of consciousness can imprint upon the waters of the body and inform us how and who to be because the water receives imprint and the cosmos can't send a higher consciousness into the water when it's rough, a wavy ocean. But when it's still, we can hear these higher imprints and they just begin to play out through us effortlessly. A 
think those are some very wise words, and I would take it a, a step farther. As you learn the skills to be able to hold your trigger and to be able to alchemize those within yourself, then start looking for your triggers. You know, I think that's the the beauty of some of the plant medicine. You know, you can ex you can get over your fear of death by having a near death experience, or perhaps maybe ayahuasca will show you. You know, maybe you can intentionally go into ceremony with the idea, I'm going to see some scary shit and I'm gonna have to deal with it. And we can do that in all aspects. We can actually trust our own strength, you know, our own ability to be able to handle this when we're ready. You know, you don't wanna go push too hard, too fast and, and be a cowboy and get out there and get burnt up. But when you're ready, go towards your triggers, go find them because if you don't, the world's going to provide those triggers and you're not going to be ready. You're not going to be battle tested for that moment where you're ready to either surrender or show up or whatever you need to do to be able to alchemize that process to be your best self at that moment. So when you find those pinches, those things like, ah, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I should do that. When you're ready, go towards them. And that's, that's how we'll become more fit, more fit for service and more able uh, to form that unity is, is dealing with them and moving towards them. But hold up, M maybe I misunderstood. I, I heard the question was, how are we going to get to world peace? And I heard the answer was, work with your own triggers. And I don't buy that. And I wanna, I'm, I'm taking a slightly won't stand on this because I hear this a lot. And I, I don't, uh, I, if you're right, I am really happy. If all we need to do is just do some inner healing and the world will suddenly work itself out, that is fucking awesome. Um, the world I look at is extremely complex with very intricate political, economic, social systems with large power structures that are deeply entrenched, that are literally conspiring together in order to maintain the status quo. May maybe helping those people to get over their triggers, may maybe some sort of Let's corral all the world leaders and give them a 5-MeO-DMT onboarding day. That is a feasible option. Um, uh, jail is a less loving option. Um, and, I, and I think that is a worth pursuing. I, I also think that there's big systemic changes that need to be made in the world. And I, I said this in my talk, but um, the, one, one of the things that, that I see is that there's... Um, I know a lot of people who are very in touch with their soul, very in touch with their, with with the, with the divine, um, but don't necessarily then roll up their sleeves to do stuff. And then you have a lot of business people or people who are in government who really understand how to like m make big moves, do multi-million dollar projects, change big systems, but aren't necessarily in touch with their heart or with their purpose or with mysticism. And as a result, end up using that energy in ways that maybe benefit them, but do harm to the world as a whole. And I think that in order to build the future that we want to see, we need people who embody both, who are simultaneously deeply in touch with their interconnectedness to the world, who, who, who are committed, as, who are committed as, as, as monks are committed to, to love and to service in the world, but who are not just meditating and who are not just looking inward. That is an incredibly important first state, step. I think you made a great point earlier. If you don't do that internal work, at least in parallel, you'll often just end up foiling yourself. But having done the, the, that, that work of, of having satisfied that level of your hierarchy of needs, I just think it's so critical that as many of us as possible are willing to roll up our sleeves, do the hard work for whatever it is you as your particular passion to figure out how can you contribute in a way that actually can move the needle, that can actually make real systemic change. Change does start within, but it can't stop within. We, ha we do live in an interconnected world. We have to participate deeply and profoundly and, and in a way that we genuinely think will work in the real physical world. Beautiful. So I'm going to, we've covered a lot of ground and this is a tough topic because it's so broad. So I'm going to kind of stay with the topic and ask each of you to share a vision for the future, say 2030, 2040. How are we going to live? How are we going to love? How are we going to do business? How are we going to exchange gifts? Just take a couple minutes to just each one of you summarize some thoughts and then we'll do one round of questions after that and we'll finish. Okay. Daniel, you want to start? Um, hmm. that, that, that's such a huge question. <laughs> yes, we, we take at least three to three, three minutes. Uh, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, I've tried in the new book to think about this like strategically. And, and I think, um, you know, hu humans beings love to have a frontier. You know, we need to be pushing towards something. 
Like it's like we have an evolutionary impulse towards, you know, frontiers, progress, what's on the edge. And you know, for over the last period, technology has become this almost like religious ideology of like the singularity that we're pushing towards emerging with machines and so on. I, I don't really think that's a very good destination. I think it's very disempowering. So I guess I've tried to think about, you know, without being anti-technology, what, what, what's other ways we could think about what we're, what we're, you know, frontiering towards, you know? And I, I personally think that the two options are like um, down and in or up and out, you know, or maybe say down and in and up and out, you know? So down and in would be like, you know, if you've explored psychedelics and, and meditation and yoga, you discover that there are these like huge arenas of, of psychic reality that we've only just begun to scratch the surface of, of what's going on down there. Maybe just as big as the, you know, externalized galaxy, maybe even bigger, you know? So I think that's an exciting frontier for the future of humanity would we'll be investigating the, 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 you know, you know, infinite potential, potentially infinite dimensions of the psychocosmos. And then at the same time, you know, why not? Like all these guys are so excited about space, like Elon Musk and all that stuff. You know, let, let, let's go and, and, you know, move to other planets, you know, make that a goal. I mean, I really like um, Alan Watts had this thing where he talked about how <clears throat> just in the same way, like um, an apple tree apples, it seems like the earth likes to people, you know, like the earth is just like, you know, an apple tree makes such a perfect, you know, so many apples, it seems like crazy, you know, it, it, apples, apples, apples. And meanwhile, the earth is doing the same thing, like peopling, peopling, peopling. And, you know, but maybe that's like, you know, and what, but what does an apple tree mean to do with those apples? Well, they want those apples to roll to other orchards or by eaten by animals or birds, the seeds get taken somewhere and another apple tree starts. You know, so maybe the earth is peopling and that's, you know, the, the next step would be we, 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 we do go into space, we populate other worlds and so on, you know, as we're also investigating deep within. Obviously, I think before we can do that, we need to figure out how we live on this planet. We're not going to be able to figure out how to live on any other planet until we get it right here. And that's why this time that we're in now is such a beautiful crucible because we have that, you know, we're on this crux. It could go totally wrong, it could go totally into devastation, you know, or, you know, we could use our creative intelligence, we could learn to collaborate and cooperate on a deeper level than ever before and build these new resilient structures, you know, that, that, that scale up from local to bioregional to planetary, where we liberate the knowledge economy, the, the creative economy, the cultural capital, you know, for everybody to, 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 to engage with that. Something like that, I guess, would be my vision. So I'm going to come from the cosmological viewpoint. Um, I see the restoration of our sovereignty as multidimensional beings moving in and out of the realms of physicality at will. Our restoration home into the tree of life. I see us transcendent of time and space because when enough of us realize that we're not bound by gravity and that time just gives us an opportunity to expand our experience and when we remember and enough of us can look each other in the eye from a place of neutrality and stillness and hold that container together something much greater than us as a human species is going to occur which is that the earth is going to go through her ascension process and we are in full acceleration now it's why the prophecies gave us the tools and techniques of how to work with our triggers the medicine of the indigenous people to prepare ourselves as the earth goes through her electromagnetic shifts as the Schumann resonance keeps spiking higher and higher, moving us into the love vibration which is transcendent of time and space. And we arrive in the moment of now, remembering that we can think apple, produce apple in the palm of the hand. And we don't need anything in between thought and creation because we are sovereign beings. And in holding that container intact in the blink of an eye, all of the reality shifts. 
That's the quickest way through. And that's the medicine of the star nations. Yeah, looking ahead at, at the world, I see, you know, both legalization of the plant teachers that's coming. You know, MAPS is already doing the work, not just the plants, but all of the medicines. I mean, the work that MAPS is doing on trauma right now, um, you know, two-thirds of all people with serious trauma are getting cured by three sessions with a psychotherapist, cured of serious trauma. There's nothing else that comes close. I mean, the veterans are coming home with a cocktail of 12 pharmaceuticals, and it's not touching it. You know, and there's cures available happening. Uh, Hefter and USONA are putting together um, the phase three trials for major depression and anxiety. We have help on the way. And it's not only going to be the plants and the medicines, it's going to be, you know, brainwave entrainment technologies as well. The ability to drop our brain into theta states, more connected states. And all of these tools and technologies are going to be a course correction for people so that we can start to have that unification moment. You know, and, and there's a million different of these technologies. I think Jamie Wheel and Stephen Kotler did a great job in Stealing Fire, kind of talking about all of these modalities that create this sense of connection with both yourself and with others. But I think that's going to become the norm. Instead of these churches, you know, putting out old doctrines and old religions, you know, on every corner, maybe there's opportunities where you can drop in with a trained psychotherapist and take an MDMA session. Or maybe we've transcended the psychotherapist and there's an even better AI version where you can go and do it completely automated, where we'll pipe in the music and, you know, it'll have a perfect experience that's scalable because it's technology, so you don't even have to train the practitioners. But a way that all of us can get back to that zero state, you know, the thing that the kahunas talk about, you know, zero state, where you're really empty you know, where the water is still. And if we get to that point, then it's so easy to love. It's so easy to help people and be conscious about making people. I think one of the reasons why we make so many damn people is we're not conscious about it. You know, we do it. We have all of our issues and our these things that come up. We're not taught about it. So we unconsciously create way too many people, but get back to the conscious creation of humans, you know, so that we can control that a little bit better. And I think all of that comes from, you know, healing the trauma and, and waking up to who we are and waking up. And, and I see, you know, I see the help on the horizon. It was like, you know, it reminds me of that scene in The Lord of the Rings where they're all fighting and they're fighting and they're fighting and it's not really looking good. The orcs are swarming them and then Gandalf comes over the hill with his white staff and that staff is made of psilocybin and MDMA and ayahuasca and they're coming through and we're like, yes, thank you, finally. We got some help on the way. And, uh, and I think that moment, that moment is coming, and I think it's going to be a radical shift, and, and if we're ready for it, I think we can propel it. But what else would we fucking want, right? I mean, it, if, if we're here, and we're the hero of our own story, and I'm not talking about one hero saving other people, I'm talking about all of us being the hero of our own story, what would we want but a situation where if we brought our best, our very fucking best, we might just be able to make it? And that's the beautiful place that we're in right now. If we all bring our very best, we might just be able to make it. And that's the only place that a hero would ever want to be. And we're all fucking heroes, every single one of us. So I look at the history of existence. And in the beginning, there were just subatomic particles. And then after quite a bit of time, I think longer than we've been around, uh, subatomic particles eventually started to dance together to collaborate energetically, and we call those things atoms. And those things collaborate, and eventually we call thing, their collaboration molecules, and molecules chemicals. And then you eventually get single-celled organisms, and those single-celled organisms get, basically continue to evolve and get more and more complex in and of themselves until they get to a point where they can't evolve anymore. The only way they can go forward is to collaborate, and they, eventually those cells collaborate enough, you get multicellular organisms, and then organelles, and organs, and organisms, and now we're ready for organizations, and even what's beyond that. So I think human beings have evolved to a point where we're reaching the maximum of our own individual capacity to change and, and become more, more interesting, and the, more, the next interesting phase is what do groups of people look like, where we're coordinating so well, collaborating so well, that it creates these emergent phenomena that are vastly more than, than the sum of their parts. 
um, over what timeline that will happen. I think it is happening already. I think when you when we dance together, when we have mystical experiences together, even when we accomplish things in, in companies together, you feel it. You can like feel that you are part of something bigger than yourself. And that collective sense of selfhood, I think, will only grow and only become more interesting and more beautiful in the way that our experience as humans is surely more interesting than the experience of a single-celled organism. Um, to be more concrete, I think that, that over some next number of decades, we're going to upgrade our consciousness, upgrade our culture, and upgrade our systems. So in terms of upgrading consciousness, working to, to heal the massive amount of trauma that, we, that we've accumulated in, as some scar over the last many hundreds of years, a, a renaissance of spirituality as we take back the baby after having thrown the baby out with the bathwater with the death of religion, um, or the, the crumbling of, of religious structures. Um, and a renaissance in psychedelics as a tool to help with trauma healing and with spirituality. For upgrading culture, I think we're going to move more from a, a culture of, of, that's centered around me to a culture that embraces we, as we move from caring primarily about our own, our own individual wealth and, and status and see that actually we're all in this together, we're all interconnected, and really what's best for me is to focus on what's best for you healing gender relations, moving to a model that's more community-based so that we return to a world in which we are not uh, isolated in these tiny little boxes but are actually constantly surrounded by people we love so that we're able to help each other and f facilitate each other's growth and be there for each other. And then for upgrading systems, um, moving to a world where we have power consolidated in a small number of people and instead en en engineer, and I use that word specifically, I think it's going to be hard. The other, one, the other ones are softer work. This is, this is just really sitting in front of computers and talking, make, making partnerships between people and do, doing the work. Um, but I think we can create a world in which there's material abundance for everyone, in which they like, forget poverty, in which everyone has access to quite a bit of, of resources, such, such like have a Burning Man-esque experience, in which decision making is done by the people who are most fit to make those decisions as determined by some sort of democratic system so that we all feel like the what's going on represents the will of us as a people, but also is being decided in a way that is intelligent and based on, on, on actual expertise and understanding of subjects instead of people who come into con Congress with snowballs as a way to demonstrate that global warming isn't happening, um, which involves a totally different economic model and a way of distributing resources that is uh, potentially even a, a total commons where everyone has access to the same, same amount of resources and where people do work not for the, the compensation but for the benefit of, of all of mankind. Um, in which we make sure that education, healthcare, food, water, are available to every single one on the planet in, a, in abundance, in which ideally we completely eliminate the criminal justice system because we find other ways of, of, of getting people to, once, we, once you have abundance, the, the incentive for criminal justice disappears for the most part. Um, and in which we've developed robots that automate all of the work that we didn't want to do and so that we can all spend all of our time making art, making love, <laughs> hanging out, yeah, and exploring the depths of space, inner and outer. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, all you four, thank you. Okay, so that was a fractal of some of the ideas of our panel. Now we're gonna do like the speed round, like in the audience, okay? 30 seconds and I'm taking the mic from you. What do you wanna see in humanity? Well, a little bit of what you've all been speaking about uh, centers on water and a little bit of a grand awakening I think is very feasible. Something that Unity was talking about was her personal experience in the cave, and I've experienced that personally with a little bit of something called self-resonance. We are able to move. It's All it is is water and ions, but it's the resonance of your own nervous system with itself. And it has this simple pleasure to it. And I think that's what's necessary for great change, is simplicity. Because the world is too complex for grand and complex ideas. You just need to tilt the scales. And if you can educate people in their own minds in the pursuit of a simple pleasure, then you can get more people moving that direction. So teaching and learning and transferring the idea of just self-resonance to other people can perpetuate and teach self-consciousness so we're less triggered by everything and all know ourselves better. Okay, simple pleasure, transmit to other people. Who else has an idea? Come on, fast. Hi, my name is Creed Kindred. I just got a download like last week. I'm fascinated with nature and the models you can learn from nature. And sparrows and like small fish, they move in these massive groups together. And I wonder, how can you do that? And I remember as a kid thinking, world peace, that's not possible. But the way the fish do it and the way the birds do it, they move in a 45 degree angle to each other. 
They don't worry about where everybody's going. They take care and they watch the, the creature next to them and they, they move together just by staying in 45 degree angles. And I think that's, that's what we need to do. We need to heal ourselves and heal the people right next to us and we move forward. And the last thing is Jesus met Mary around conscious water. We're, we're to meet around conscious ancestral water to, to heal each other and have water be the conduit for our conversation where we give our excess that we have and we meet there and we take the excess that others have and we trade that way. So thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. I feel a breakthrough coming on. Anyone else? Over here. No one over here. Okay, we'll go back over here. Hurry. Loud. I just wanted to share that when it's all said and done and that when we've concluded our lives, the greatest thing that we can take with us is our connection with other people the personalities that have entered our lives um, and the appreciation and the adoration of those personalities. Our, our brothers, our mother, our friends, our lover, um, however temporary they may be, the, all of that that has impacted our lives is all that we can take away with us. And, and I, I believe the memory of all of these stays in our chakras and enters our new life. And sometimes these personalities that we've had, that, that have had impact on us, will re-enter our next life and life beyond. And I think before it's too late that we should really take each day to really appreciate those who are close to us and don't take it for granted because they may not be there when we finally want to express our love and devotion to them. Thank you. Beautiful. Hey, one, thank you. One thing we forgot to talk about is community and tribe building. Huh? How are we going to not, how, we got to live in tribes, right? We got to live on land together, build our land-based communities. That's my solution for the future. Land-based communities, more tribal existence. Let's do it now, right? It's happening all over the world. Who's next? So uh, one idea I have is um, an emphasis on funding psychedelic science as a language to communicate with other people who do not understand these ideas. I think it's just some of these ideas are abstract and hard to quantify or qualify to people who have not had any experience with these chemicals. And I think MAPS is not the only organization that does this work. There are places all over the country that um, really have trouble getting funding because there's not a lot of incentive from academia to do this type of research. And I think this is the type of community that can support this type of research. So that's why um, that's my solution. Okay, fund psychedelic research. Who's back here, who? Come on, Josh. Oh, okay, all right. Um, I'd say taking our cryptocurrencies and uh, being able to transition transition those into a contribution economy where we don't have uh, resources being valued and only our flow of energy so that the other billions of dollars aren't worth anything anymore and matching matching systems so that we um, don't end up in these environments that are not synergistic and uh, so we can stay in resonance and yeah so we can find our tribes world peace uh, there is a solution uh, we do have prophecies involved we are a tribal uh, people we have cosmic beings um, that have been supporting us for a very long time <clears throat> the prophecies about the rainbow children from the Lakota Sioux involves the people the gathering of the people from the West that are connected from the heart and that's what we're waiting for. Uh, there is a project by the, that's known by the elite and the elders from all the top, top spiritual, um, see, even secret families know these things. It's called Project Jason. Project Jason, if we are ready as a community, as a uh, rainbow people from the West, we will gather together in a July time of July next year. We will call in all the heads of state, all tribal elders, all religious leaders, all spiritual leaders, and then we will also include the children, the children that are ready from here. That's the prophecy. 
we will have this event full on global media covered so that complete transparency from that point on. We will ask every single individual from every country that every representative, if they're ready to co-create with us a new earth. And whoever is ready, we will co-create from that space. We will connect with each other. Everyone from the uh, clean water technology, we will have them gather together. And we will start working together as a collective. The, there are funding. There is funding for all the humanitarian projects already set up. But the elite will never open it. They all have instructions. They're not the enemy. The truth is they have instructions specifically for the awakening, awakening of humanity. They're creating terror. They're showing it right in front of our faces. Why? Because each and every one of you have gifts. You have pieces of the puzzle that you're supposed to share. Your soul brought it in this time and window so that we can come together as a people. Whatever we're going to create after that, at the end of Jason, the July, August, September, October, November, by November, you will see something amazing, something magnificent, that all the top indigenous elders that have spoken to this particular week, they all, we resonate. The elders in the Philippines said, we cannot, Humphrey, we cannot do anything with these funds. They're trillions, quadrillions amount of money. They said, you guys from the West are supposed to use this. You have the technology. You have the global gathering and connecting from the heart. That's the only way. Because if we have the funds, but we're not connected from the heart, we will perpetuate an old paradigm. But if we're connected from the heart and we have the funds, whatever we create from that space will be sustainable. It will be regenerative. And there are higher beings involved uh, helping us with this process. And I know you feel it. Nobody could come back to the old ways. I know you do. You, you can't because you have your instructions. I have mine. And, um, you know, that's, that's all I can share with you for now. But do know there are holders, wisdom keepers, specifically for this time and space. But we need every single one of you to connect. And that, I, I do believe, Brad, what you're saying about community, we need to ground that because we are the ones we're waiting for. Truly, we are the ones. And, and it's time. Today is the day of the condor and the eagle. And if you're not familiar with that, it's the day when the condor is ready, the eagle will come. The eagle is the highest uh, uh, animal among the totems of the indigenous. And it's a prophecy. It means when we're ready, the future that we're looking for will come uh, uh, with all of us. And I know there's so much suffering, but it is the soul, every soul will reincarnate into a new higher vibration that we're going to co-create together. We are all wisdom keepers. We are all witnesses of the old age, and we're going to bridge it to the new. And we will see that together. No one has ever seen that in any any star systems, what we're going to co-create has never been seen or done before. Thank you. Thank you. This, this gentleman's name is Humphrey. He's the real deal. He's connected to the Philippine elders and the royal families of the Dragon family. So listen to what he says because help is on the way and it's really happening right now. All right, we just have a couple more minutes, but I want to make sure that everyone knows this is Amanda Gregory and she will be performing tonight. This ball comes down at midnight. It's the alchemical moment. And after the alchemical moment, she'll do a one-hour show called Andromeda. Over here in the skybox <laughs> is the gentleman that had the vision for this pyramid. I want to thank him from the bottom of all of our hearts. Chris Kralak, thank you so much for bringing Playa Alchemist to the Playa this year. This is the most inspirational space anyone could have on the Playa. Please bring it back. Let us do this again for real next year. <laughs> we'll even put the whole skin on next year. Okay. So a couple more, couple more comments. <laughs> oh, okay. So the thing to do that we can possibly just automatically do for the rest of the time that we are alive is speak our fundamental authentic truth all the time. Woo! And so all the unsaids and all the unfelts, and we can just uh, do an emotional export sequence of that. 
that we can deconstruct our identities in a safe way for one another because the looking good thing is the biggest barrier that we have to accomplishing any of these goals. Um, and uh, the subtle ways that we limit our self-expression um, and then therefore like step on what is ultimately going to lead to a solution, um, to me just looks like <sighs> exhaling what feels most true. Like what's underneath what you're really saying? What's behind what you're really saying? What's behind what we're really saying? And um, so that's, that's really what I gotta say is just, I gotta say, let's just say shit. Yeah. What's behind it? Okay. <laughs> All right, who has the last comment? All right, we're gonna go to the panel in a minute. Who hasn't spoken? Yes, a woman. It's a good point. I think women have a lot to say. Well, this woman's spoken a lot already. Is there anybody who else? That one. Which one? And then this one. All right, this one. Yes, I think I know her. <laughs> I see human reality restructured into a new sacred story inspired by the wonder and the beauty and the interdependence of life. So real quick, coming from an architectural background, what I really see making the difference here is reconstructing our urban form. And the way that makes, a, that way it, that makes an impact is how humans interact with each other. As soon as all of us go home from here, what we're going to do is we're going to get in our cars, we're going to go back into possibly our suburban homes, and we're not going to talk to any of our neighbors. Maybe some of them, but at least where I live, I know maybe a handful of my neighbors. This city here has a completely different urban form that connects people and puts us in a village setting. That physicality, that direct interaction and interface with people, that's what's gonna cause us to interact with each other and, and recreate this new world. So what I wanna say is that instead of just doing this out in the desert, away from everything, we need to start doing this in our cities where it can make a difference and we can bring other people into this experience where they can have a face-to-face -face contact with others and build community. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, one more. I want to live in a village. I want to live in a village with my own little cell and then a community space to meet all my friends in and to get help in. And I want a temple to be there and I want trees and a river and no cars in 2030. Thank you. All right, we all want heaven on earth and it's so obtainable. We just have to work together. Oh, yes, thank you. All right, I've been dying to say this. So when we were talking about the judgment thing earlier um, and the fact that we are all essentially one, you are me, I am you, and when we judge others, we're judging ourselves. And I'm so glad she just said to speak your truth, to be honest. Um, and when we're really honest with ourselves, then we can be honest with everyone else and we can be transparent and we can love each other for exactly who we are and have no shame in that whatsoever. And I look at all of you and you're all so beautiful and amazing and I'm so honored to be here. And just like, we have to keep this alive. The magic has to stay alive. We can't judge one another. We can't judge ourselves. We have to love fully and unconditionally always. Absolutely. God, that's beautiful. Everybody, we're, we're going to burn in three hours. We're going to all die together and be rebirth, okay? So let's do this. All right, panel, last, like, chance for your wisdom. One minute. Yeah, I think in all of this and all of this striving and all of this pushing and all of this looking for change, let's not forget to have fun because it's all change. It's always going to be striving. It's always going to be pushing towards something. But if we sacrifice enjoying ourselves now for that future thing, there may not be that future thing. It might just be the human condition to always be pushing for better. So smile, have fun, enjoy the process. Don't worry about the goal. Be there for the process and love it because the process is all we got. I second the having fun part because the river does know its destination and it is flowing fast. Listen to our hearts so that we can joyously, consciously participate in something that we can't imagine. And as our brother shared in the back, it's coming fast. So let us enjoy it and have fun. We've already done it together. Let's dig deep, let's be real, let's be vulnerable, 
Let's go deeper into embodying our spirit into this human spirit experience because we're not ascending out of the body. We're trying to get all that great spirit into these bodies. So let's have fun. I'm grateful to be sitting here in the presence of all of you and this amazing panel. I thank you. I love you. Aho. Uh, I don't really have another word of wisdom, but thank you so much for listening and for participating. And it was beautiful to see you all here. And I'm excited to collaborate with all of you in the near future to bring about the things that we've discussed. Ditto what Daniel said. Um, I said ditto what Daniel said. But um, I like to think of the universe as my art project. And by my, I mean, you know, us. That the, the to, we are we are that oneness we are that ultimate consciousness or purusha in, in yoga, and then there's this whole world of matter and form and, and material, and I would say we're doing pretty well. I would you know we managed to populate and uh, create a planet, populate it with atmosphere, create life on it, and now we're building cool pyramids and which are. Which is funny because we were already building pyramids a long time ago and there's carbon atoms, but now we got big pyramids, really big pyramids. And yeah, maybe this is the thing we're all saying is like, when you're making art, when you're making really complex art, you, you do enter problems and challenges and how am I going to make these things fit? How am I going to make all this work? And it, it is easy to get serious about, well, every, the, the oceans are dying, lots of people are suffering in poverty, and I think compassion is important. We should take that stuff really, really seriously as our own, our very own suffering, which it is. And at the same time, to remember, like, this is all, or a way of looking at it, this is all a game, this is all an art project, this is all us as God, or whatever you want to call it, just sculpting the clay that is matter reality. And I think we're doing pretty well. And even whether it's this planet that makes it or another one, I think in general we as consciousness are going to create just increasingly beautiful magical structures over time. But we only if we have a shared commitment to doing so. So Udo was, uh, thank you guys. Uh, Udo was on our uh, earlier talk, and I want to just give him as one of our elders. Last word. So in my tribe, there are 8 billion people. And by the time that we're talking about, they all know to live more lit up from within by going in and looking into the light we are instead of away from that light. And in that place, we feel so taken care of that we don't steal each other's shit so we can live in harmony together. And when we live in harmony together, it is very simple to take care of all of everybody's basic needs in a way that is sustainable. But it requires us to be feeling taken care of, because until we feel taken care of, we'll always try to take care of ourselves, even at the expense of everybody else. So number one, get real fully present in all of our being, like the masters recommended. And from that place, they all said we had that in us, from that place, the world becomes a different place. We are wired for that change. We have always been wired for the change. We just need to look into it and connect to it. My name, Udo Erasmus, the father or mother of flaxseed oil. And uh, today we decided I was the motherfucker of flaxseed oil. <laughs> Uh, again, we have Justin Rosenstein. You can be, reach him at oneproject.org. Daniel Pinchback, uh, best URL for you? Uh, I guess howsoonisnow.info. Howsoonisnow.info, based on his new book. Uh, Unity Grace, how would they reach you? Through Facebook? Luminosity. Luminosity. And Aubrey Marcus, uh, what's the URL? AubreyMarcus.com. AubreyMarcus.com. My name is Brad Nye. I'm the co-founder of Red Lightning and curator for the programming here at Playa Alchemist. Please come back next year. I want us to have a Pandora moment. I want everybody to come forward and let's just touch everybody and let's just have a moment together because I feel very close to you guys. I feel like we're going to do this together. All right? So let's all have a moment where we touch and we feel each other. Just put a hand on somebody. We are, we are doing it. <laughs> this road. There is no separation, it's just an illusion. <laughs> what else do you have to say about that? Ascension 
to psychic technologies, we don't need material technologies anymore. We return to Lemuria. Okay, all right. Well, let's start by blessing from the earth up. We are made of the earth and spirit unified. Giving our offerings of grace and love to Unchi Maka, Pachamama, Gaia Sophia, Earth, Oceana, to that energy that gives us life, to that breath, that one breath that flows amongst us all. Mini Wachoni, water is life. Honor the fire, honor each other, offer each other a hand when we're stuck. Reach to the heavens and beyond and open to the infinite possibility that we are together. Where to gather, may the mystical third come through and inform us with the greatest of joy and grace and ease and flow at home.